Family Theater presents Maureen O'Hara, Stephen McNally, and Howard McNear. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, brings you Stephen McNally and Howard McNear in Edgar Allan Poe's classic, The Gold Bug. To introduce the drama, your hostess, Maureen O'Hara. Thank you, Jean. This week, Americans are honoring the 100th anniversary of the death of one whose contributions to American letters seem destined to live forever. For in Baltimore, 100 years ago, Edgar Allan Poe died after a short and stormy span of 40 years. In tonight's tale, we bring you one of the analytical stories of Poe, which started a whole new era of modern writing. For his logical step-by-step recreation and solution of a problem is the basis of the present-day mystery with which we are all familiar. It is a story that reflects the earlier and possibly the happier years of Poe's life. Based upon his years in the army, when he was stationed at Fort Moultrie, South Carolina, and where he often wandered the shores of Sullivan's Island. It is this island that serves as the setting for our story, and it is my pleasure to present Stephen McNally as our narrator, Edgar, with Howard McNear as William Legrand in The Gold Bug. Often in our work, we lawyers see the end product that results when man's senses suddenly desert him, leaving his body prey to the lashes of his emotions and his soul to an even greater scourge. And once, once it seemed I saw the beginning of this awful force, a force that turns man into beast, that erases from his consciousness all but the galling prods that drive him ever faster to his dreadful doom. It started that day when I returned to Sullivan's Island. It's a lonely island in the fall of the year, and never before had I experienced the chill winds as I did that October day when I returned after months spent in Charleston. My law practice being somewhat slack during the preceding week, I had decided to come down to visit once more with the master of Sullivan's Island, my friend William Legrand. Legrand I had known in older days, when he could still welcome the sight of people's faces. Before he made his decision to abandon the city life that had brought him only successive disasters, disasters provoked by the tragic strain of insanity in his family. We had been closer in those days, for he was then of more open mind. But of late, I remembered only how volatile were his expressions and how capricious his moods. As I neared the hut, the sight of the smoke coming from the chimney prompted me to run, and I was soon at the door. no one there save me. And wherever my astonished glance fell, it encountered a riot of disorder among the usually meticulous furnishings. As I stood there, wondering whether it were the defections of the Grand or Jupiter that could have caused this neglect, I heard a welcoming voice outside and turned to await the Grand. (laughs) Edgar! Edgar! Oh, Edgar, what good luck for me. Jupiter! Come, see who's here. It has been a long time, hasn't it, William? Oh. (laughs) It's good to see you again, Mr. Edgar. This island has need of company. Come, do sit down. We have much to talk about since all these months have passed between us. I'll set the pot to boiling. Some hot tea will take the chill off this weather. That, Jupiter, is an excellent idea. Edgar, I would rather see you than anyone I can name. I have most extraordinary news. I found a truly rare treasure. (laughs) Some of the Captain Kidd treasure chests that... Every charlatan swears is buried hereabouts. 
a, a new species of bird life, my friend. You are much closer with your second guess, Edgar. In fact, I found a most amazing specimen today. You must look at it tomorrow. Why must you keep me in suspense until then? Come, show me this wonder of yours. I wish that I could, but not knowing you'll be here, I let one of the officers from the fort have it overnight. He is a naturalist, too. Oh, but I must really return to Charleston tonight. I have a case coming up tomorrow. Why not tell me about it, and I'll come down again next week to see it for myself. Ah, uh, see it you must, for you'll not believe me when I tell you. Today I wandered over near the West Beach, and suddenly I thought I saw a golden glint in the sand there. I found it to be a scarabius, the like of which no man has ever seen. <laughs> I confess I'll never understand your fascination with these weird insects. You naturalists must all be insane. And never say that word insane again, do you hear? It has an evil sound. It makes me... Well, now, you don't need to be upset, Mr. Legrand. Um. Forgive me, William. I, I'd forgotten about your family. Believe me, I meant no harm. Yes, but I, I'm sorry, but you know how distasteful my memories are to me. Please, uh, continue about the beetle. I don't know yet what it looked like. I tell you, there was never one like it. Pure gold in color and heavy as a stone. And only about as big as a hickory nut. But even I have seen yellow beetles. Oh, you? not like this, I can assure you. It has two strange jet black spots near its head and another near the tail. Oh, but here, I'll sketch it for you. Let me see. Ah, uh, let's see now. I know I have some blank paper here somewhere. Well, there's a piece sticking out of your pocket. Perhaps that would do. Oh, is that? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, this is the paper I used to wrap this scarabius in. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. It looks as though it were real parchment. Uh, Jupiter found it for me. And I'll tell you again, neither of them will bring good luck. Mark my word. <laughs> ah, poor Jupiter. Seems to see specters at every hand these days. He would have had me leave the scarabius at the beach. It's bad luck. You'll see it too, Mr. Edgar. Once you look at that beetle. Uh, come, will you? Make your drawing and let me judge for myself. Yes, I will, answer. <laughs> Though I must confess I've never seen Jupiter so overwrought. Ah, yes, now I'll draw this and you see... Uh... And the dots, here and here. Now, Edgar, look at this. Yeah, this is a strange one. I never saw anything like it before, unless, uh, unless possibly a skull or a death's head. A death's head, yes. Possibly the markings on it would give that appearance, but it does not really resemble one. <laughs> Perhaps so, but I feel, Legrand, you are no artist. Edgar, I draw very well. I should, at least. I've had good training, and I'm not exactly a blockhead. Well, then you must be joking, for, for this is a very good skull. And where are the beetles intended? Oh, very well. I should not have drawn it, after all. <clears throat> and we wouldn't have gotten to this argument. Argument, William? You know very well what I mean. Here, I'll toss the accursed thing in the fire. What? Well, what's <gasps> the matter? What on earth is this? Well, upon my word, what well, this cannot be. Uh, uh, you must forgive me, Edgar, but I have work to do. Uh, uh, Jupiter, see Mr. Edgar back to Charleston. I, I'm sorry, but right now I, uh, I must be alone. And leave I did. For from that moment when he first glanced at the parchment he snatched from my hands, he was lost in concentration. To be honest, I was in no good humor that night, as with Jupiter, I picked my way through the darkened island to the boat landing. But by the morning, I was absorbed in my work, and so was greatly surprised when an excited Jupiter arrived at my office with an urgent request from Legrand that I return immediately to Sullivan's Island. What can be the matter with the ground, Jupiter? He was in good health last night. He hasn't complained of any pain, but he's sick just the same. Is he uh, confined to bed, then? No. He won't sleep or rest at all. Just works at his desk and then rushes out of the house and starts measuring things. Measuring things? What things? Practically anything. He just walks this way and that way, counting his footsteps and making all kinds of figures on the slate he carries. But what can he It's possibly... the bug, if you ask me. That's what it is. That old gold bug bit him. Oh, now, really, such nonsense, Jupiter. It's probably only a fever he has contracted. You'll see. Here, you go in alone, Mr. Edgar. I'll wait outside. Very well, Jupiter. 
Jupiter! Did you bring Edgar? <laughs> Jupiter's waiting outside, William. Oh, oh. But I think the poor man fears for his life. What's happened? Ah, uh, Edgar, come in, come in, come in. I thought you would never get here. You, Jupiter, come in. You will be quite safe. Oh, Edgar, I need you here. Especially if I am to further the views of fate and the gold bug. Well, then, when am I to see this fabulous In good thing? time, my friend, but first we have work to do. Oh, here now, William, William. Yeah. You mustn't excite yourself. Uh. Sit down and begin from the beginning. Yes. Remember last night when I handed you the paper with my drawing on it? Well, of course. <laughs> and now, look what happened to it. Well, nothing has happened to it that I can see. It's the same skull-like drawing you made for me last night. Oh, well, now, turn it over. Oh, but this is the drawing of the beetle. I can see the antenna. Precisely. And on the other side is the skull, brought out from the old parchment by the fire last night. But, but where did it come from? It's witchcraft, I tell you. That gold bug has an evil spell. Remember I told you I used it to pick up the gold bug? We found it in the sand near the beetle. Well, then the drawing must be a very old one. The parchment looks well worn. Yes, that's true. Now, last night after you left, I heated the whole thing over the fire, and I found the message upon it. Oh, William, there's no message here. Oh, yes, well, wait, you should see here. Let me put the paper in this pan of water, and we'll place it over the fire again. Oh, yes, you shall see. You mean the heat will uh, bring out Many of the... these old parchments can be restored through the use of heat. Now, when you handled it last night, the heat from your hands combined with the temperature of the room uh, to bring out the message. Well, look, it's beginning to show up now. There's, there's a picture on it. Why, it's an animal. <laughs> Precisely. And what do you think it is? Well, it, it, it looks like a goat, I believe. Yeah, so I thought. But if you will look closer, you will see it is a kid. So? Oh, well, come, 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 come. First the skull, then the picture of a kid. Now, surely you need no further clues. So we have pirates and a goat. I fail to see any reason for your excitement. <laughs> Unless you're trying to conjure up a plot worthy of a two-penny thriller. Oh, not a goat. I have just said it was a kid. Surely you heard of... Captain Kidd? Oh, I guess the, oh, the pirate, of course. Why, well, see that the, 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 the picture's where the signature should be. Ah, yes, and now look at the paper. Between the signature and the skull at the top. Ah, yes, what are you seeing? Uh, nothing yet. Now, wait a minute. Uh, wait a bit. There are, there are lines coming up. It, why, it is a message. Look. I know, I know, I know, but wait until you can read them. No, I, I can see something. It, it's a number. And there are some more. Oh, but the whole thing is numbers. <laughs> of course, come. You must read them to me. Begin from the top and read across. Well, 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 begin, begin, begin. This may be worth a fortune. Hurry, hurry, hurry. One, eight, eight, semicolon, question mark, semicolon. And that's all. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Now we have it. Have it. Have it. In heaven's name, man, what good is a page of blurred figures? It's a message, don't you see? Well, of course, but what message? I'm as much in the dark now as ever. Calm yourself, Edgar. Let us approach this with logic. Logic? What is logic is there in gold bugs, pirates, and ciphered messages? I ask you. Obviously, the message must be in English. Obviously. So... It could be in Hindustani for all these numbers that tell us. Now, the pun on the word kid could only occur in English. So if there is a message here, it must be in that language. Now, let's try a transposition cipher first. Uh, of course, if it's in code, the fat is really in the fire. Well, what difference does it make whether the message is in code or cipher? Can it both be solved in the same manner? Indeed not. A code uses a set of symbols which stand for words, a set already agreed upon by the encoder, while these ciphers, they merely substitute numbers and symbols for letters. Now, come, come, come. First, we must uh, table them according to frequency. Well, I can tell at a glance. The eights are most common. That's good. Then count them. Uh, they must be the E's. Why, how does that hold, William? Well, the E is the most common letter in nearly any given sentence. So the eight must be the E. And after the E comes A, O, I, D, H, etc. Ah, but we'll worry about them later. <laughs> There is the completed message. A good glass in the Bessop's Hostel in the Devil's Seat, 21 degrees and 13 minutes northeast. But this makes no more sense than the original. 
The words are there, but they mean nothing. Ask the Goldberg. It can tell you. Try to break it into sentences. See, in the manuscript, there are often places where the characters are run together. An uneducated man might do that as he was making sentences. Say, that might be it. For example, the first sentence would be, a, a good glass in the Bessop's hostel in the Devil's Seat. But what does that mean? <laughs> that is but one of the answers we must find, my friend. And I fear we must scour the countryside to do it. And scour we did. For in the days that followed, Legrand and I talked to each and every soul that lived about us. At every hand, we found the same answer. The same blank stares, the same accusing glances that more than once began to convince me I had lost my sanity. Then Legrand heard of an old crone who had lived in the vicinity for more than 80 years. We found the incredibly old woman, her cracking voice making our hearts <laughs> race. She strove to recall facts from generations past. Men always come to me, and I tell them, <laughs> I tell them what they wish for a price. Oh, yes, I always get a price. Name it then, Grandmother, and let's get on with it. Yes, uh, you must forgive my friend. His impatience is only youth. Now, in the village, they, they said you knew the Bessops. Eh? There's been no Bessops hereabouts for 50 years and more, son. And an unfriendly folk they were, too. Oh, did they live apart from the village then, Grandmother? I have heard tell of Bessop's hostel. Bessop's castle it is. <laughs> You'll sleep cold tonight if you expect to stay there. Do you mean there is a Bessop's castle? Where is it? I told you before, young man. Meet my price, and I'll tell you how to get to the place you oh, seek. Well, name your price, and it's met, Grandmother. Twenty good silver dollars. Twenty of dollars? Of course, what? Grandmother. Here, hold out your hand. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. Now, now for this Bessop's castle. You must first go to Sullivan's Island. Yeah. The island, Grandmother. Where do we go on the island? Up on the western shore of the island, you'll find a lonely pile of rocks. And there, as you go along... What do we do now, William? This country is too barren to leave us a clue. Look down there below us. No, 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 to the right a bit. What do you see? Why, it looks as though the waves had carved a chair out of the rock. Ah, <laughs> precisely. The devil's seat, my lad. Give me the telescope. Here it is. Now, now what? Uh, read the directions in the note. I'll use them to sight with. It says, uh, 21 degrees and 13 minutes. Uh, that's good, good. Next. Uh, uh, northeast and by north. Uh, that's right, right, that's it. It brings the glass onto that tall tree. Tree? Well, then it says main branch, seventh limb, east side. What do you see there? Uh, ah, ah, there's a rift in the branches. Uh, what on earth? Quickly, what is it, William? What do you see? I, I don't exactly know, Edgar. But um, I think it's another death's head. <laughs> That must be the tree, William. It towers above the other. Yeah, we will soon find out. Jupiter, give me the spade and get ready to climb the tree. Here, take the gold bug with you. No, sir, no, sir. I don't want to be hexed up there. Oh, what? By the gold bug? Oh, nonsense, man. Nonsense. nonsense or not, I don't want anything to do with the gold bug. It's a hex. Well, if he's afraid of the beetle, William, why not let him go up without it? Oh, but he can't. We will need it once he reaches the place. Yeah, yes. Up the tree with him now, Jupiter. Here, I'll give you a boost, lad. Yeah. That's a good lad. Keep climbing. Ah, Jupiter, stop there. Stop there a moment. What's the matter? How many limbs below you now? Count them. There's five. That's good. Uh, go one higher, Jupiter, and sing out. 
I'm there now. Now work your way out on that limb as far as you can go. Ah! Uh, but what's happened, Jupiter? It's the skull nailed into this old wood. But that's good. That's good. Now listen to me carefully. Find the left eye of the skull. Yes. Yes, I've got it. <laughs> that's good. Now, now listen carefully. Take the gold bug and drop it through the left eye. Now drop it. Yes, sir. I see. There it comes. There it comes. Ah, look at it clear. Ah, there it is. Ah, quickly, mark the spot. Really. Ah. Jupiter, get back down here now. We've more work to do. What are the pegs for, William? Wait, wait a minute. Ah. Ah, 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 ah. ah, there. Yes, now hand me the measuring line, Edgar. And now follow me and bring the spade. And use it with goodwill. For each stroke shall be a golden one. Oh, my. It's got to be here. My, my calculations must be correct. Oh, come, Willem. Let us rest now. We can dig again tomorrow when it's light. Oh, yes, that's it. We'll come again tomorrow. Then we will find it, I know. Come along, Jupiter. Here, I'll help you up. Reach for my left hand. Yes, sir. Thank you. The left one. Oh, the other one, Jupiter. The other one. Of course. Jupiter, come here. Y yes, sir. I'm coming. Now, answer one question. And without fail, or so help me, I'll skin your life. Y yes, sir. And answer it immediately. Which is your left eye? Oh, uh, it's this one. Oh, oh uh, yes. <laughs> but, of course, but, I forgot. But, You've always had trouble that way. Come along, come along. Back to the tree, quickly. Ah, this game is not up yet. Now, was the skull face outward from the limb or towards it? Uh, it, it was facing out. And which eye did you drop it through? Why, the left. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> the right one. Come, we must try again. Now, quickly, hold the cord. Oh, but it would only make a difference of an inch or two. Let's return tomorrow, will you? Oh, an inch or two, you say? Look what happens when I run the line directly from the tree through the spot where the gold bug should have fallen. Why, it's, it's yards to the right of where we were. Indeed it is. And there, our wager will find our goal. So come, let us dig again. It will not take long this time. <laughs> I hit it. Did you hear? Did you hear? The chest is there. We found it, William. Yes, we must have. Here. Let me hand. We must clear it away. Yes. 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 Now, quickly, quickly slide the bolt. Then we shall see who has been man. Feel them. Feel them. They're real. Oh, there, there must be a fortune there in gold. And those jewels. William, we're rich. Nor did we sleep that night. For in the firelight of the cabin, we sat amazed as we counted up the pirate treasure. Through it all, Legrand chuckled and would from time to time glance at me as though I were to share in his private chest. At length, goaded by my curiosity and his laughing glance, I asked for the explanation he knew must be forthcoming. And all made excellent sense until I asked him why he had insisted Jupiter carry the gold bug when he climbed the tree to the death's head. He laughed again then. <laughs> A rising laugh that made me catch my breath. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it was for your benefit, my dear Edgar, to punish you. Punish me? <laughs> well, no doubt I deserved it, but the exact cause escapes me now. Oh, come, come, come. Confess. Did you not doubt my sanity again? Well, uh, well no, 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 of course not. I, I was only afraid that the excitement might prove too much for you. Oh, for my mind, you mean. 
You need not be tactful. You've doubted me all along. That is why the gold bug helped me. Only I understood its message. It was the gold bug who was our guide. <laughs> or perhaps you think it was... Um, uh, but who can tell? I ask you. Who can tell? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen McNally and Howard McNear, for your splendid presentation of The Gold Bug. You know, The Gold Bug was the first story of Edgar Allan Poe that I ever read. It holds a special place in my memories, along with Tom Sawyer, Treasure Island, and all the other stories we first learned to love in grammar school days. Hearing it again on family theater calls back those days. The books we read, the songs we sang, the teachers we had and the boys and girls we all knew so well. It's good that we have such memories, and it's only right that the memories should be happy ones. Especially do we have a right to have happy memories of our home life, our parents, our brothers and sisters. In fact, I'd say that parents owe it to their children to see that their childhood days are something that they will always look back to with gratitude and joy. To make better homes in America and to furnish parents with a workable, God-given formula for bringing happiness to their home, Family Theater recommends that you begin the practice of daily family prayers in your home, for you'll find it to be true that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood Family Theater has brought you Stephen McNally and Howard McNear in Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug with Maureen O'Hara as your hostess. Emperor Clemmy was heard as Jupiter with Martha Wentworth as the grandmother. This adaptation of Poe's classic was written by Arthur Sawyer with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. It was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. These Family Theater broadcasts are made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. This is Gene Baker inviting you to be with us next week at this time when your family theater will present Oscar Wilde's fantasy, The Happy Prince, starring Loretta Young and Vincent Price. Join us, won't you? Family Theater salutes the Newspaper Boys of America and reminds you that Saturday, October the 8th is National Newspaper Boys Week. Successful boys make successful men. This program came from Hollywood. This is the World Series Network, the mutual broadcasting system.